Hello everyone, a warm welcome to the program. This is Politics Today, live on Channels Television. I'm Sean Wakimbalo in Abuja. Let's get straight to it because we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Let's begin by telling you that it appears that all is coming together as far as the preparations for the 2023 general elections is concerned. This is because the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has unveiled a fresh regulation and guidelines for the conduct of the elections in Nigeria. The commission unveiled the document at a special meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security at the INEC headquarters in Abuja. Speaking at the event, Chairman of the Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubo, notes that the new document is necessary as a former document no longer fits in with the provisions of the new electoral law. With the release of the regulations and guidelines today, and the publication of the strategic plan 2022 to 2026 and the election project plan 2023 earlier, the Commission has virtually concluded the planning processes for the 2023 elections, nine months ahead of the election. In the next couple of weeks, the training manual will also be presented to Nigerians. Going forward, the Commission will focus attention on election administration, logistics, training, voter education, technology, sensitization against vote buying, inclusivity measures, and above all, security. And here is the new guideline as released by INEC, which will guide the conduct of elections going forward. I guess it will start with equity election on the 18th of June, and of course the July election on Northern State, and generally later for the 2023 general elections. Well, so much to talk about. When Bola Tinubu went to Abelkuta yesterday, it threw the political atmosphere into some, um, how will I call it, threw some bombshell, and a lot of people got talking about what he said and the things that he said. Now, aside that, is the fact that 10 people will not be on the bill. They're out of the race as far as the APC presidential primary of Monday is concerned. Now we get talking about that, and my guest tonight, of course, those are, if you say, movers and shakers of the party, and those who are seeking the number one seat in the country, tonight, get ready, everyone. We get talking, but after the political roundup. President Mohamed Buhari has returned to Abuja from his two-day state visit to Spain in response to an invitation by his Spanish counterpart, Pedro Sanchez, down at the presidential wing of the Namdiaziko International Airport at about 12.40 p.m. The presidential candidate of the Action Democratic Party, who doubles as the chairman of the Interparty Advisory Council, Mr. Sani Yabaji, has received the ADP certificate of return to fly the party's presidential ticket in 2023. Mr. Yabaji, who addressed journalists briefly after receiving the party's certificate of return, Turn, promises to provide the needed political leadership that Nigeria needs to actualize her potentials. We have the agricultural resources. The potential is there. You know, we don't suffer uh, natural disasters. You know, the, the weather is very kind. The soil is very fertile. So the only thing that we have which is between us and that greatness is leadership. Senator Victor Ume today clinched to the Labour Party's ticket for the Anambra Central senatorial seat for the 2023 general elections after participating in the primary election. Ume will battle Senator Uche Ekudife of the People's Democratic Party, Abgaz Dozien Wankwo, and Chief Kodili Chukwu Kilikwe of the All Progressives Congress in the main election next year. The River State House of Assembly has screened and confirmed three commissioner nominees as requested by Governor Nyesum Wiki. The nominees are to form part of the River State Executive Council, which is to be reconstituted following the dissolution of the cabinet two weeks ago. The nominees include the immediate past commissioners for justice, Professor Zakios Adango, SAN, and that of finance, Isaac Kamalu, and a former advisor to Governor Wiki on special projects, Alabo George Kelly. The governorship candidate of the ADP in Akiti State, Ms. Kemi Lebutihali, 
is calling on her fellow contestants to shun politics of force and voter inducement as the state warms up for the June 18 election. The only female candidate in the race acknowledges that she's been spared of violence so far, probably due to her gender, but she condemns some violence against unarmed electorate, calling on contestants to play by the rules. Election should not be a do or die affair. If you are using cane that is soaked with charms and all manner of things, you're using it to, to, to beat a kitty people. Who you feel that you want to lead? Do you want to be a governor over dead bodies? And the governor of Adamawa State, Umar Fintiri, has cautioned the judiciary to dispense justice by ensuring that transparency, discipline and efficiency should be their watchword in carrying out their duties. The governor gave this caution during the swearing-in ceremony of four judges of the state at the banquet hall of the government house in Yola, the Adamawa State capital. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Let's also tell you that the All Progressives Congress APC Presidential Screening Committee has disqualified 10 aspirants from its primaries scheduled for next week. The chairman of the committee, a former governor of Edo State, John Oyegun, today said only 13 out of the 23 aspirants screened were cleared by the committee. Take a listen to him and the national chairman of the APC. Thank you so much. As it is with every competition, we will receive the report now on each of them. Uh, we will consider it at the very highest level of the party and uh, see how we approach the forthcoming convention, which has the ultimate uh, authority on the choice of who takes the flag, uh, it is our hope that due consideration will be given on the basis of the facts available to those who would be uh, opportune to be behind the decision. The those who sent us have the report, and I think it is their privilege uh, to disclose whatever is in it, not us. They haven't read it yet. We just presented it. So I can't come and disclose the details in the report. We are not aware we disqualified anybody, but uh, I think most of them were high quality people and they passed the basic test. Governing a country is not a joke. So you look at the background of everybody, you look at their ideas, you look at their appreciation of the realities of the Nigerian polity, and uh, that is it. All right, however, when he was asked about the identity of the disqualified aspirant, Mr. Ogun declined to disclose the, the names. But Mr. Ogun added that, contrary to rumors making the rounds, that he did not screen former President Gulag Jonathan, uh, uh, so he spoke also about that. Well. Yesterday, the All Progressives Congress APC national leader and presidential aspirant Bola Tinubu dropped some bombshell about his role in the political ambition of President Buhari, Vice President Noshibajo, and that of the governor of Ogun State, Akwa Biodun. Bola Tinubu says he was instrumental to the ascension into power of the trail and says now is a time for him to take a shot at the number one seat in the land for the benefit of those who have not seen that video where Bola Tinubu spoke in Abel Kuta Ogun State, I will play for you tonight. Uh, although it is in Yoruba language and we have tried to transcribe it for you in English language. So watch out for the transcription on the, of the text on, your, on the video on your screen. First, this is a statement on uh, Muhammad Buhari by Bola Tinubu. Tio Basi, I watch a meeting room. What you eat in Larry Ogun? Ten okay, but I didn't so come up. I love only the present. Oh, the king, oh, Lule, oh, the gay, oh, Lule, oh, the gay, oh, Lule, oh, the so color in television. Well, I don't 
Alright, those are the words of Bola Tinubu. Let's speak on these issues raised by the statement of Mr. Bola Tinubu and the state of the race. Um, of course, he spoke about Vice President uh, Oshiba Joy, he spoke about the Governor of Ogun State and several other issues that he raised at that meeting in Abelkuta. I'm being joined by a former governor of Borno State and a sitting uh, senator in, of Borno State in the Senate, Senator Kashim Shetima. He joins us live here in our studio. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining Thank us tonight. Thank you very much, sir. First and foremost, I guess uh, I'm wondering where I should start from, but let me begin from the, uh, the screening exercise. I know you may not have a lot to say about it because you were not part of the process, but if you look at the scrutiny of your party, 23 were the ones uh, that were the people who put themselves forward. 10 had been disqualified. Um, you think that is a very strict and uh, thorough job? Well, I don't want to jump to wild conclusions, but by and large, I believe they must have done a thorough job, a just one. And in spite of the speculations in the social media, they have not released the names of those that were recommended for disqualification. But be that as it may, my own candidate, my own principal. And who is that? Ashua Jubola Ametinibu. He had contested elections in the past under a very hostile federal government. He was a senator. He was a two-time governor. And it's preposterous. It's a gratuitous insult for anyone to insinuate that he has been disqualified. So they are it's saying that he may have been disqualified. No, you know, when you are the front runner, you will be the subject of the most vitriolic of attacks. And if you keep on stopping to throw stones at every dog that backs, you will not reach your destination. We know where we are going. We are very confident of victory, inshallah, on Monday. And such issues do not distract us. Mm. We believe he's in the contest. What we are hearing is that the party or the screening committee seems to want to give chance for younger folks. Does that in any way inhibit the chances of your principal? I do not think so. Because it is a function of the mind. It's just a number. And there are some younger people that can perform abysmally low. My own principal has the experience, exposure, and a lucid mind to add value to the nation. And we are a very critical conjuncture in the current annals of Nigerian history, buffeted by all sorts of challenges, be it security, be it economy. So a leader that we need shown is a leader who understands the dynamics of running a modern economy. The world is a knowledge-driven world. We have moved from the agricultural age to the industrial age. Now we are in the post-industrial knowledge-driven age. And you need a Nigerian president who has tested, who has been tested with excellent and competent leadership skills, and most importantly, with all these agitations for non-inclusion and separatist tendencies around the country, you need a leader who understands the Nigerian sociology. And we don't have a better person. Or, we'll, we'll get to the personality, yes. the competence, and the yes. capacity yes. of Bola Tinubu. Yes, but let's go to the statement he made yesterday. First and foremost, there's been a lot of criticism about what he said. First and foremost, there are those, the school of thought, of the, I mean, those who believe that it oozes, those statements ooze a sense of entitlement. And um, it does look that... Um, Self-aggrandizement is what some people describe it, of the role it played in the ambition of others, especially the President Muhammad Buhari. Does it come in a bad taste? You know, people cannot be indifferent to Bola Tinibu. 
like the late Ghani Power Amy, you either love him passionately or hate him intensely. Hating him, depending on your aptitude for jealousy. What he said yesterday was not a new thing. Can anyone come out and dispute what he had said? Neither in what it gives about taking ownership of being Not responsible only. for uh, he, he President Buhari's he played a very crucial. To... He played a very crucial role in the ascendancy of President Buhari. I was a foundational member of the APC. And those that suffer from memory amnesia may forget about the role of Ashua Jutinibu in the ascendancy of President Muhammadu Buhari. If we can go down memory lane, you know, the relationship transcends goes beyond 2015. It started quite earlier. They made an attempt at a marriage, even in 2011 election. But prior to the 2014, 2013 merger and subsequent presentation of Muhammad Buhari, some famous traditional, a famous traditional ruler from Northern Nigeria, led his own team, went to Ashwaju in Lagos and told him, not in our name, he doesn't represent us. A group of retired generals equally approached Ashwaju and told him, not in our name, he's not our candidate. So also the Northern establishment, a professor led the team and disowned President Buhari. And to add insult to injury, the icing on the cap was a delegation from Katsina that disowned the president and said he is not their anointed candidate. He withstood all those pages. And at the presidential primaries in Lagos, without the block board from the southwest, Buhari couldn't have clinched that problem. I was part of that. There are those who say that find uh, the ACN block and the role of Balatinubu and the Southwest uh, stakeholders were instrumental. But those who, I mean, there's those who believe that the new PDP members, the Amechi, the Atiku Abubakar, the Bukola Saraki, they are joining, took the APC as it then was without the NNNP, NPDP to another level entirely. And if not for those uh, NPDP, the APC wouldn't have been able to get a chance, not solely what Bolatinobu did. Well, I appreciate your input. But in 2015 elections, Rotimi Amechi, as the Director General of the Presidential Campaign Council, was able to garner 69,238 votes for the APC candidate as against the 1,487,705 votes garnered by the PDP candidate. President Jonathan got the highest quantum of votes in 2015 elections in Riba State, he got the highest percentage of votes in Riba State. He got 94.44%. You know, facts do not lie. People may make efforts to distort history. In the whole of the South South, Les Edo, President Buhari got 210,131 votes. Less than what? Less than half of what rural Yobe State contributed to the kitty. And politics, as Steve O'Neill said, is local. Your ability to generate votes establishes your relevance. But Ashwaju and his team, the Southwest, in 2011, because we have to compare figures, in 2011, the president got 72,000 votes in Oyo State. By 2015, he got 500 and 62,000 votes. In Ekiti, he got 2,689 votes in 2011. But in 2015, he got 120,133 votes. In Ogun, he got 17,654 votes in 2011, as against the 308,290 votes he got in 2015. I can roll out all this. I am, I am historically armed. Yeah. In, in I, mean, I, can... I, I, I mean, a lot of people will respect the fact that you're not, uh, 
yes. and not just uh, someone who became a governor. Yes, sir. You are astute in whatever you have laid your hands on, and respect has been given to you, your person, and your pedigree. Now, the, 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 some of the issues, if you've read, for those who have submitted on what Balatinobu said in Abelkuta, one of these was uh, that it also oozed a sense of entitlement. That he said that he has oh, made Yoruba people proud and all of that. But it, now is the time of the Yoruba people, and he is a man for the job now. So those who have criticized that, that in itself is a sense of entitlement. What is wrong with him demanding for the leadership? He has paid the price, and this is a man when his other AD colleagues where Blood John were roasted by the wily old general from Ota. He had the wits, the wisdom to stood his ground. Not only that, sir, this is a man with a ferocious pension of sacrificing his own good for the enthronement of democracy in this country. The Yorubas respect Obafemi Aulo not because He's an Ijebu man. No. They respected him, not because he was a lawyer. They respected him because he was a transformational leader who invested heavily in infrastructure, in education. And Ashwa Jibola Ahmed Tinibu is about the most successful politician from the Southwest ever seen. He has built men and institutions. So you cannot even call him amongst equals. It's a gratuitous insult. The Minister of Works and Housing is his protege. He's one of the best performing ministers under the current system. Rob Arek Beshola was his commissioner for Works and Housing for eight years. The vice president, a very cerebral person, was his attorney general and commissioner of justice for eight years. I can roll out knee at the by. Mm. Most of the ministers... So he deserves that yes. sense of entitlement? Yes. He should be given the right of peace refusal. What is wrong For the presidency of this country? For the presidency of this country. Out of the over 200 million Nigerians? He has aspired. We have not stopped other people from aspiring for that position. Every Nigerian, 25 people, 23 have been screened. Any other Nigerian has the right to aspire for any position. But that does not preclude him from exercising his fundamental right as a citizen of this country. And most importantly, with the skills, with the administrative skill set and the intellect to transform. Is system. he offended that uh, maybe the president did not accord him that chance of force refusal? Let me be very, very frank with you. He wasn't offended. That particular interview was deliberately taken, distorted, embellished. And taken out of context. I have said so in so many for hours. Why did that nobody took me up on that? An idea to tell you, sir, that when the president emerged as the presidential candidate of the APC, he has a captive vote of 10 million in the north, but his popularity in the south was very low. It was the same southwest people that repackaged him that brought in experts, the devil had the role from the Obama team and so on, that repackaged him and sold him to the Nigerian people. You cannot dispute established facts. You may hate Bola Tinibu as a person, but as H.S. Aga said, the truth that sets men free is most often the truth that men prepare not to hear, and we'll continue telling them. I mean, I'm not sure it's about hatred of his person, and I think it's about the uh, conversation on the issues that have trailed the race. Um, perhaps on the issue of uh, Professor Oshibajo is another issue that's been raised. Uh, how much of uh, uh, offense it is for him, those who think the, the issue of betrayal comes to play, and also uh, not looking at the competence of a, a Professor Oshibajo as a person. Nobody has doubted the competence of Professor Osibanjo. He's a very humble, competent, cerebral person. But we believe 
that in terms of intellect, capacity, reach, and the ability to move this nation forward, and most importantly, for us to win the upcoming election, the best candidate that the APC has is Ashwa Jubola Ahmed Inubu. With the name recognition, mind you, the dynamics has changed to the emergence of Atiku, Vice President Atiku Abubakar as the candidate of the PDP. We need someone who can match and even overshadow him in terms of brand name recognition, in terms of intellect, in terms of capacity, even in terms of indefatigability. So this is why we are championing the cause of Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. He's not first among equals. He's the best amongst his mentees. You think he's the best? Yeah, certainly. So you best. mentioned Atiku Abubakar. Yes, sir. And you said that that dynamics has changed things. Yes. Uh, for those who say, I'm a Lawan from the same Northeast as Atiku Abubakar, is there an even? I mean, does that make the race even in that sense? Well, my own position is very simple. APC was formed by a merger of so many interests. The ACN, the ANPP, the CPC, the ABGA, ABGA, and of course the new NPN. And in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious polity like ours, we have to be sensitive and conscious of the diversity of the nation. Ahmed Lawan is my kinsman, is my brother. And he holds me in the highest esteem. And I played a very prominent role in his emergence as the president of the Senate against my own kinsman, Mohamed Alindume. But leadership goes beyond sentiments. He has spent 20 years in the Senate, in the legislature. He's a, he has a PhD in geography. He has spent a stint in the academia before joining the political industry. Does he have the administrative skill set to rule a complex nation like Nigeria? This is a million dollar question, and most importantly, sir, Can he also stand shoulder to shoulder with Anatiku Abubakar? He can't. You think so? I, that's the fact. You know, he's a peace amongst equals. Let's not delude ourselves. He became a senator with 144,000 votes. I became a senator with votes two and a half times that he garnered in UOB. No. Go to Ohiapia or Izochuku and ask for Ahmed Lawan. The first name that will come to their mind is that of the tomato dealer who is bringing tomato from Maiduguri. Go to any other part of the South. Does the brand name sells? So you think Tinubu is a name that sells? Tinubu is the best person. We, we don't even have any option. What about Oshibajo? Does the name sell? The VP? Oshibajo is a good man. He's a nice man. But nice men do not make good leaders. Because nice men tend to be nasty. Nice men should be selling popcorn, ice cream, and balabobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobob
because there are some political jobbers in this country who are hell-bent on plunging this country. You know, the trajectory of global growth is facing Africa, and Nigeria will make or mar that transition. And getting the leadership question right is absolutely essential. Mm. And where the leader held from is not the issue. I just cited the instance of the chief of army staff. We had the chief of army staff from my own state. But our security situation deteriorated further under his stewardship. The president chief of defense staff is an Ika man. The president chief of staff is from Sokoto. But our security fortune has improved tremendously. Right. So, so I'm not particular about the Northeast or Ahmed Lawan, but I am particular about justice, mm. equity, and pianists. OK, uh, Your Excellency, I have just about 60 seconds or less to, to close the program. But I have two crucial questions. Yes. Although you did not answer the question of whether or not for Zulu, uh, the reason we are on, why. We are, we are on the same page, I can assure you. Is it you. supporting Bolatinobu too? Certainly, okay. we are on the same page. All right. So the delegates from Borno are voting for Bolatinobu? Certainly. All right. So uh, on a final note, in one part, uh, quickly, if you can let Nigerians know, if Bola Tinubu does not get the ticket, what happens? He's going to get the ticket. What if he doesn't get it? If it's a game of numbers, he's going to get it. What if, I mean, the president has asked for a chance of reciprocity that he should choose who, is, who succeeds him. What if the president does not pick him? You know, people tend to underrate the depth of the relationship between the president and uh, our candidate. Their relationship precedes 20 15, 20, 14. And the president is a man of conscience who holds Ashwa Jutinibu in the highest esteem. If at all, President Buhari, a man of conscience, a god fearing man, will anoint any candidate. That candidate has to be Bola Tinibu. It has to be, but if it doesn't be, it if it doesn't be, get Tinibu, to say, doesn't be, this is politics. But what I am saying is that the president, being a Democrat, in a worst case scenario, mm -hmm. Anointing a candidate doesn't preclude candidates from going for the primary elections. So Tinubu will go for the primary so for the most He will never step down. The issue of stepping down does not arise. But if the president is the elephant in the room, how do you expect an elephant to step down for for, for Lilliputians? So certainly, <laughs> on a more serious note, the issue of stepping down are just mere speculations. And right. most importantly, even the issue of anointment, the president's special advisor on media came out and disputed. When I was leaving the scene, naturally I had an interest. I anointed Professor Zulum. But other contestants, Idris Durkwa, Omar Nasko, mm -hmm. Gambolawan, contested with him at the primaries and he won. So in the same vein, the president is at liberty to endorse Bola Tinibu. But Bola Tinibu will still go into contest for those that are willing to slug it out with him. Senator Kashim Shatima, a sitting senator of Bruno State in the National Assembly and a former governor of Bruno said, indeed, it's a pleasure having you tonight. Thank, Thank you, you so much indeed for coming. Thank you very much. We we'll take a break, everyone. And when we return, we will be speaking with one of the APC presidential aspirants, one of the young ones, Jack Rich 10, on his ambition and his plans. An agenda if it gets the ticket of the APC. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. Let's now turn our attention to speaking with those who have their heart right in the center of the ring. And one of the youngest presidential aspirants of the APC, Mr. Ten Jack Rich, an oil and gas expert turned politician, joins us tonight on his presidential ambition. Thank you so much, Mr. Jack Rich, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, you optimistic about uh, uh, We don't know who, who's made the cut, but do you think you made the cut? I think it's in the hands of God, because so I believe strongly that um, whatever you do, God first. So we're just praying and having our fingers crossed. <laughs> How did the screening go for you? I think it was really tough. I uh, never had it before, but I believe I was able to 
you know, state my points clearly, what I, what I can do. And I was able to give uh, a brief historical background of where, you know, where I'm coming from and what the country really needs uh, and how my skills can actually help in setting the country um, on the right trajectory in 2023, considering all the uh, global uncertainties and uh, economic shock wave that we will be dealing with. So I was able to put uh, my intellect forward and um, how I believe I can, uh, you know, administer, you know, the country. What gives you the confidence uh, to get into this race? Because you, you never get into a battle that you, th that you think you will lose. You are hoping that you are going to win. What gives you the confidence that you can? Well, I think basically, I believe strongly, I'm sorry, I have to be, I have to be straightforward. I believe strongly in, um, in God, because uh, whatever you do, God first, like I said. And again, I've been able to build, you know, uh, you know capacity to the point where I, I can add value to my country, knowing fully well where the country will be in terms of uh, the economy in 2023, you know, looking at the numbers. Uh, and also uh, what the future, you know, has gotten for us as, as a country in terms of employment, in terms of industrialization, uh, in terms of ensuring that we are able to balance uh, trade and all that. You know, if you, look at the, if you look at the numbers of our foreign reserves, you know, you will be scared uh, if you don't have the mic. Uh, 2023 will, will have to uh, overwhelm you. But because I build a strong, uh, you know, business uh, capabilities in terms of how to turn numbers around, I believe strongly that we need a president that can turn the numbers around in 2023 so we can improve on our foreign reserves. Because if you look at the uh, import and export numbers, you will see clearly that we are having a whole bunch of deficit of about 21%, uh, which means, you know, the simple rule of thumb that says at least you must have uh, your reserve being able to, you know, fund your import um, or trade by at least for six months. You know, so, so if, you, you, look at, you, if you look at if you look at the uh, 67 uh, billion dollars, you know, import uh, consumption, uh, you're going to be scared if you don't have the capacity to deal with the issue. So I believe I can top up our reserves and ensure that I get to that equilibrium. You think Nigeria is in trouble presently? Well, I don't want to believe that Nigeria is in trouble, but what I'm saying is that we will be in trouble in 2023 if you, uh, if you have the wrong man on, on the seat. You, you, you also think that the economy has been badly handled? No, I, you know, there are, there are certain variables that we must recognize that this administration has been battling with. Um, if you look at the crude oil numbers, the numbers are, numbers are not meeting up, and that was because of COVID pandemic when OPEC you know, allocated to member states certain volume they have to produce because the price was going below ground zero. And when you shut in to ramp up production again, it requires a lot of money. So if you look at the numbers and the population and all that, in the surging population and our struggle to have the right infrastructure to create the right employment that can mitigate the exposure, the government has really tried its best. But what I'm saying is that 2023 is what I'm talking about, that you need a president that understands the microeconomic dialectics to be able to put in the right mechanism in place to deal with what we will be, uh, we'll be faced with in 2023. You see the global uncertainties in terms of uh, uh, continental Europe still struggling within the Eastern European bloc disrupting supply chain and, and, and global logistics. So, and you think to change that around, the best man for the job is yourself? I believe strongly the best man for the job is Jack Reed because I understand how to build the numbers. The most important thing is to top up our reserves. Our reserves, if we run with the current trend, are we, we're likely to be, about, be around about $38 billion in 2023. So your import must be able to meet up your reserve by at least six months. All right. That's a simple rule of time. Let's so, get into some of the details of what you're talking about and the realities and the practicalities of some of the uh, points that you are putting forward. First and foremost, you, you have, you're pushing that Nigeria will make, uh, will dwell more on the oil and gas to catalyze the economy. That's what one of the ideas they have been pushing. And for those, is at a point in time that a lot of people are saying, we need to look away from oil and gas and look elsewhere. 
but you are pushing and saying perhaps because that is your business area that's your expertise is that the reason why you're pushing for that no sir uh, we need to recognize that we need deep ticket foreign exchange earnings to activate other industrial value chain within the country so we can at least have that uh, you know balance of payment but oil and gas is a quick win for us. You know, it contributes about 85% of our foreign exchange earnings, which is export goods. So that's a significant element. And again, about 19% of, of our total import um, is around the oil and gas petroleum product. So that's about over 5.3 trillion Naira goes into, into that market. So if I can save 5.3 trillion by ensuring that that foreign exchange that we look for is taken away and then had it to other economic value chain is going to go a long way so we need to recognize that all other sectors outside the oil and gas account for about 15 percent of of export goods so how much can you really realize to procure the right technology and activate other economic engines yeah. so you said that if you become president in 2023, you will push oil production in Nigeria to about 3 million, bar per, uh, 3 million uh, barrels. And people will ask you, is that, is that realistic? I mean, the quota that has been given to Nigeria is not even within that range. Nigeria still oscillates between, I mean, just around 2 million uh, per day barrels. Yeah, think, How do you do that? Thank you. You know, the most important thing we need to recognize is that we mustn't export our commodity alone. We must also have the capacity to refine them. So I believe strongly in vertical integration. There are other operators that want to vertically integrate. So if OPEC allocation is 2 million barrels a day, we have 1 million barrel surplus. So what do you do with the 1 million barrels? You activate other economic engines by refining. Not only that, uh, you have a lot of, you have large, you know, volume consumption locally and also within the continent of Africa and in the world. So why can't we refine and export refined products? So that's a lot of money also. Do we have the capacity to produce 3 million barrels? Well, we, well we, we, we will have the capacity to produce 3 million barrels a day because How? that's my business. So they are low-hanging fruit. So what you're going to do basically is that you liberalize the sector a little bit uh, so you can have you know, foreign investment coming in. Uh, to partner with a lot of the operators and then collaborate with them to increase their yields. Not only that, uh, if you put the right mechanisms in place through, you know, uh, uh, strong local participation, you save a lot of the volume that you lose through theft and all this type of stuff. So every operator will be made to contribute his fair share, ensuring that you put all the technological requirements in place so that you produce dry crude. So you don't inject, you know, you know, mixed crude uh, in the pipeline, and then you start saying that the crude is stolen. So we have a strategy through our policy framework that will enable all operators operate in a different way. But you've not told us exactly how you will push production to three million barrels per day. We have our in reserve. practical terms. Yeah, basically. So you will have to upgrade. So basically, facility upgrade is number one. Building new pipelines, number two. And ensuring that the flow stations no longer serve as flow stations, they, be, they become production stations. And how long will it take you to do that? I mean, all this can be done, you know, um, I'm, I'm telling you, to be very honest, in 18 months, you can put all these all this stuff in place. Nigeria doesn't even push. have a functional refinery. Well, that's what I'm saying, that you can vertically integrate. So as soon as you liberalize the sector, there are some operators that want to industrialize so that the full value chain is also realized. So we will ensure as a matter of policy that those that want to vertically integrate, they are brought into the value chain and what are the incentives that they really require to actually get it done so that investors can look at it and say, well, this is good. And then they can pump in, in you, know, you know, funding in there so that we can uh, get those sectors activated so we can save a lot of these, you know, uh, foreign change earning that uh, is leaving the shores of Nigeria that we should have helped to build our reserves. One of the other things that you have said is the, the jobs that you will... You will uh we get Nigerians, and also you've talked about how you use education um, and knowledge-based economy to radicalize the, uh, the, the Nigerian state. You also spoke about how much of international engagement you will make should you be president. But the question is, there is a nagging problem of insecurity in the land, which is going to discourage a lot of people. Naturally, people say insecurity will not allow FDI. Now, the question is, how would you solve the problem of insecurity? You've said it on this platform, that you will 
activate traditional ruler, uh, rulership system in the country. But how do you do that if that is not captured in our laws? Well, I think both conventional and the non-conventional means will be deployed. I mean, this is for national security, so it's important that you go beyond the boundaries of what you think you can read on the pages of papers. So we will create that ecosystem to bring in all the value chain on board. But again, we have to make sure that we provide the economic stimulus. That's, what is that's that? so important. And creating opportunities at the rural areas and getting our traditional rulers really, really empowered so that they become part of the voices uh, that transmits and communicates what I call traditional moral. But again, of what, me, of what use is your moral message when a man or a family cannot provide food on the table? So we will create our stimulus, and that's why it's important for me to move oil production to 3 million barrels a day so that uh, you know, we can at least put together 5% of whatever we realize from there and spray it across 8,900 wards in the country so that every local community will have a leadership that will have access to economic enablers. So you take that and preach that pari passu. They have to go hand in hand. Stop this left side of life. It's not going to help us. This is an economic opportunity for you to start your life with. I was asking then, about a solution to insecurity. For example, in the northwest region of the country, how would you end banditry? Well, technology is number one. And it's part of my vision for a prosperous Nigeria is introduction of technology-based you know, leadership. You're getting technology in, not only that, you introduce technology and power our servicemen and women, uh, build a strong defense capability, both hardware and software deployed. But again, having the carrot and the stick approach, I'm sorry to use that word, but again, providing that economic enablers at the very world level, at the very local level of the local community, so that they say, you know what, this is a new jingle. We don't want to go this left wing of life because opportunity has come to us. So why are you getting involved in kidnapping and banditry when the enablers for you to realize self-dignity is now before your doorstep? So you got to stop that left wing, of left side of life, and move into uh, the uh, proper, you know, uh, should uh, you, I mean, proper behavior that, you know, champions societal wellness. Should you be left in the arena with the likes, uh, against the likes of Bola Tunubu, uh, Yemi Oshibajo, and Rocha Sokorocha and the likes? Do you think that you can uh, get it together? Well, I believe strongly that what the country is looking for um, is strategic visionary leadership. Uh, that is young, they can connect with the, you know, you know, larger generation that are pretty much young today. The population of this country will be 223 million, and um, the median age is 19. So what is in there for these young guys? So I am a typical example. I'm a success story. I've, I don't have any baggage. I've never been in politics before. I never made any campaign promise to anyone that I've not been able to fulfill. I'm a job creator. I'm a development agent. So the youth resonate strongly with someone like Jack Reed because I'm a job provider. You know, and what they need is job, helping them to realize their goals. So when they graduate from school, they can have jobs. And then again, they are able to go to school, acquire, you know, the right knowledge so they can come out and get the right job. So my interest is basically what the party interest is all about. And I believe that's the interest of Nigerians. Should you not How, uh, be picked because you're understanding there might be a consensus kind of, what would you do? Well, you know, I'm a party man. So whatever, you know... And he heard the governor saying that whatever the president says, they are pretty much in tune. I'm in tune with whatever the party says and whatever the president says. But I believe strongly that 2023 is a unique year. We need a president that can look at the numbers, the job numbers. We need a president that will be able to increase our foreign reserves. We need a president that can enable the critical economic engines that drives our economy that is draining us real hard uh, to be plugged. And then we can have surplus to be able to increase our reserves and then activate other economic engines so that we can grow a profitable economy, provide jobs on the table for our young youth, and also uh, move this country uh, into a realm where we are highly respected by other member states uh, on the continent of Africa. Mr. Tenja Hukrich, presidential aspirant of the APC, thank you so much indeed for coming tonight. And I wish you the very best in the primary. Thank you very much. Thank you so much thank for you. coming. But that's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks for watching. I'm Sean Kimale. Bye for now.